The classic conventional physical exam, as we perform it, as we interpret it, and as we teach it, is often wrong. It includes maneuvers that evidence has demonstrated are not helpful, or which in practice have been entirely replaced by common and inexpensive technology. It does not include maneuvers which have been described more recently and which evidence does show are helpful. Even when useful maneuvers are performed correctly, we often misinterpret our observations because of knowledge gaps regarding what pathology those observations suggest. And our exam is even hindered by pervasive myths about what is normal. But it doesn't need to be like this. We can do better. My name is Eric Strong, and I'm a practicing hospitalist and an associate professor at Stanford School of Medicine, where I've been teaching the physical exam for 15 years. This is an introduction to my new course on a practical, evidence-based physical exam relevant to the 21st century. I call it Strong Exam, as a parallel to my clinical reasoning course, Strong Diagnosis. This course will be unlike any other resource on the internet and will be unlike the physical exam training you received in school and residency. To see what I mean, I need to first explain a particular model of physical exams, which subdivides them into three types. The first is the textbook exam. This is the collection of physical exam maneuvers that are described in classic physical exam textbooks and to which conventional pathology texts refer. The textbook exam is an historic relic that has not changed in the last 50 years, and arguably has changed little in the last 100. There is also the evidence-based exam. This is a set of maneuvers and findings which has seen strong evidence for their use published in peer-reviewed literature. The evidence-based exam changes constantly, with new evidence for or against certain maneuvers getting published all the time. And then there is the practical exam. This is the exam which respected, experienced, and outstanding clinicians perform on patients in real-life settings, even when not directly teaching or being observed by trainees. The practical exam changes more gradually than the evidence-based exam, but unlike the textbook exam, it still does change and evolve over time. You can see from the diagram that there is imperfect overlap of these exam types. Unfortunately, most schools, and maybe all schools, focus their instruction on the textbook exam, when what they should be focusing on is the intersection of the evidence-based and practical exams. In short, we teach our students a bunch of stuff that no one does in real life, and even if they did, much of it wouldn't be helpful anyway. So why? Why do we do this? There are two commonly cited reasons. The first, what if the practicing student is someday practicing in a location where diagnostic testing is limited and they need to rely more heavily on the exam? That may sound compelling for a brief moment, but when you think about it more closely, this reason doesn't hold up. Apologies to my viewers from particularly resource-limited settings, but coming from a traditional American or European medical school, how often will a student eventually find themselves spending a significant amount of time practicing somewhere that doesn't have x-rays or rudimentary ultrasound. I spent six months at a hospital in the highlands of Papua New Guinea where patients slept on the floor and the building sometimes had no running water. Yet even there, x-ray was available. We did not rely on agophony and tactile fremitus to diagnose pneumonia. But even more so, citing a hypothetical lack of technology is not okay because it implies that these exam findings that only fall into the textbook exam part of the Venn diagram are useful at all. But many are not. Percussing the liver is no more helpful to diagnose cirrhosis in Rwanda or Haiti than it is in San Francisco or London. It is objectively not a useful thing to do. The second cited reason for still teaching a textbook exam is because at some point, 
our trainees will be in a position where they will be expected to do these maneuvers while their competence is being assessed by senior faculty. For example, in an evaluation format known as an OSCE or Objective Structured Clinical Examination, where if the student can't do the maneuver, it will hurt them professionally and it will reflect poorly on us as teachers. Now, unfortunately, there is some truth to the concern that a trainee will be penalized for not knowing how to do something that's actually useless, which is not just frustrating, it's absurd and, and really should not be a reason that we continue to teach these useless maneuvers. Occasionally, people hear criticism like this of teaching the textbook exam, and they mistake this for criticism of the physical exam in general. This is not the case here. If it were, why would I have created an entire course on this? The issue is not that we should not be teaching the physical exam, but rather that the physical exam we teach should be one reflective of evidence and modern practice. And currently, that is not the case, which is precisely how this course will be different. Instead of only teaching a physical exam that will make you look like a good clinician, it will teach you the exam that will actually make you a good clinician. This will not only help you, it will help your patients, which is what this is all about. I'm now going to switch to discussing the structure of the course as a whole. After this introduction, there is a video that will cover general exam-related behaviors, such as optimizing the exam environment, communicating with the patient, and proper draping of the patient for different types of exams. This is followed by five videos on the vital signs, one for each. If that seems like overkill, I assure you that each will teach you something new. Then come videos on the traditional organ systems, like the pulmonary, cardiovascular, abdominal, and neuro exams. Some of the videos will teach what I call the core physical exam for that organ system. The core exam is the exam that you would perform on a new primary care patient who you are seeing for the first time, or on a patient being admitted to the hospital for a problem that's not directly related to that particular organ system. For each core exam, there will be one long video doing a deep dive on maneuver techniques and potential pathology, and one short video demonstrating just the flow of the exam without any commentary. These will also include tips on proper documentation and the verbal communication of exam findings. There will be videos on specialized maneuvers that are important to know, but which are only indicated in specific situations. For example, shifting dullness to identify ascites or pulsus paradoxus to identify cardiac tamponade. And there will also be dedicated videos on what I consider to be archaic maneuvers. Archaic maneuvers are those that are part of the textbook exam, but which literally have no place in the contemporary practice of medicine. You might wonder, why would I bother talking about them at all, even if in a separate video? Well, first, as already stated, many schools still teach these maneuvers and still expect their students to be able to demonstrate them. I don't want my viewers to be penalized for using a resource that is more up to date than their own faculty's expectations. And second, some of these maneuvers are interesting from the perspective of the history of medicine. For example, learning how pleural effusions were diagnosed in the 19th century before the discovery of x-rays. But if your interest in this course is solely becoming a better clinician, these videos on archaic maneuvers can safely be skipped. Throughout the course, I'll be incorporating the evidence behind what I'm discussing, and each video will have a list of references in the video's description. In general though, this course relies heavily on two specific, highly recommended references. The first is ironically a textbook, Evidence-Based Physical Diagnosis by Stephen McGee, currently in its fifth edition. And the second is the long-standing series in the Journal of the American Medical Association called the Rational Clinical Examination. In addition to those two references, for viewers that want more examples or even more discussion, um, I recommend checking out a couple of additional uh, resources on the internet, like my colleague's website for the Stanford 25, as well as Andre Mansour's excellent site, physicaldiagnosispdx.com. I'm hoping that as a future update to this course, 
I'll be able to include examples of how to tailor entire exams to specific patients. For example, if a patient presents with a particular past medical history and is now reporting such and such new symptoms, how do you choose which maneuvers to perform in order to acquire all the relevant information in the most time efficient manner possible, given the patient's differential diagnosis? That concludes this introduction to Strong Exam. I hope you'll find this course to be helpful. I believe you will. Please feel free to leave questions, comments, and feedback below.